I want to begin by asking you to repeat the story that you told yesterday during the press conference of the moment in the museum. When you were when, when you looked at the Van Gogh painting. So uh, and this, Mike. this mic is not working. Maybe a short. There's another one behind. Short There's another one behind. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah. You told the story. Okay, so uh, I'll give you the short version. Great. And then he can elaborate. Okay. I'll give you a little bit of a longer version. Great. <laughs> um, Johnny Depp had a book called In the Hand of Dante. Yeah. By Nick Tosh. Yes. Great book. Crazy great book. Mm -hmm. And he... Um, had a few books and he asked me if I wanted to pick one to make a movie out of and that's what I wanted to do. Mm. And Jean-Claude, uh, there was a m movie made about Jean-Claude and he was on the cover of a, it wasn't quite done yet and it was a San Sebastian film festival and there was a picture of him on it and he looked like the devil. Okay. So I said to him, <laughs> he kinda, I mean, I said, this doesn't look anything like you. You look like the devil. And this woman that was with him said, well, would you make an image of him? Never said it to me. Right. I, I said you looked like the devil <laughs> then. Anyway, okay, but anyway, <laughs> you can see, you don't believe anything he says. Anyway, okay? yeah, okay. So then um, some time went by, the video came out, or the film came out. I never did it, and but the lady never forgot that I said I would do that and kept us in contact and mm. I was in Paris one day and he came to a show I was in at uh, Tadeusz Ropak Gallery. Yes. And um, we made an appointment for me to come over to his house to take that picture even though the film was out already or whatever. I said I was going to make the image and I wanted to. Anyway, uh, that 24 by 20 inch camera that you have here, yes. I wanted to do that there, but the lady who worked on the camera was out of Paris, and so I went with Vlad, who is the, uh, who played Dr. Ray in the movie, and he had an iPhone, or a cell phone, which is, I didn't really know how to work it. Yeah, this is what year? Generational thing, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I also brought a piece of paper with me. Right. And I made a drawing of him with some blue paint, uh, he lives in Pigalle, uh, in the same building where Toulouse-Lautrec had his studio. Yes. So I made a drawing of him on paper in Toulouse-Lautrec studio mm. and gave it to him. And he said, uh, you can't give that to me. And I said, yes, I can. He said, no, you can't. And I said, yes, I can. And he said, well, no, you can't. And if, uh, I guess if you give me that, I have to do something for you. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. He said, well, I'm a script writer. I will write you a script. And I said, I don't need a script, but I need help with the one I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, he'll help me. So I started to live at his house, mm -hmm. and we were working on the hand of Dante. And I don't think he ever really liked that that much, but mm. I think he maybe got a kick out of talking to me. Mm -hmm. I, I did my best. Yeah. Well, we, we, it was about 80%, and I, I thought it was good. I don't, anyway, so here we are. That's not necessarily happening. Mm -hmm. And there was an Artaud and Van Gogh show at the Musée d'Orsay. Artaud drawings and Van Gogh paintings from all. And we were looking around at the paintings. Mm -hmm. And alone. Alone. There was nobody else in the museum. It was closed. So we yes. were looking at the paintings. And I thought, OK, because this man had been asking me if I wanted to make a movie about Van Gogh for a couple of years. And I definitely didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so. But at the end of that experience, I thought, okay, well, if the structure is that, say, there are 15 paintings in a show, mm -hmm. there's 15 vignettes, e each act, something happens with, as if you saw each painting, mm -hmm. and accumulatively, at the end, you walked out like you saw the whole show, that could be the way we would approach writing this. Yes. And he had a totally different experience than I thought we were having. I thought we were having a fine experience and it was very, but he actually at that moment, but I didn't know how he felt until, what was it, about two months ago he told me this after yes. we've been doing, and he can tell you how he felt or what happened at that moment, but then I realized why we did it because at that moment he decided that that's what we were going to do, which was for a different reason than what I thought. So right. what happened to you when we were 
looking yeah, at the painting. We were just the three of us. I mean, very close, you know, to a self-portrait by Van Gogh. Julian was there, Van Gogh, and I was here, the three of us. In a sort of intimacy, incredible. And I had the feeling, while uh, Julian was explaining to me technically, not artistically, that's quite important to me. He was telling, he was talking technique, and he was telling me, you see, look around, look carefully, there are three different blues. The Prussian blues, the Cheruleum, the Bleu Marine, and then there is a small, very thin red circle around his eyes. You know, and I was looking, and I had the feeling that Van Gogh really was listening to us, that almost I was hearing his heartbeat. It was extra to me. I had never felt anything like this before in front of a, of a, of a painting commented by another painter, you know, the, the, a painter talking about a painter, but not trying to tell me it's beautiful, it's so, no, talking techniques. That was extremely impressive to me. And uh, when, I, when we left, when we walked away, I had the feeling that Van Gogh was following us like this, you know, with his eyes, you know, that mm -hmm. was really alive. And that, I, I, I said, I mean, we said to each other, let's try to make a film about this. Mm -hmm. I, I never felt, you know, I was about 80 years old, and I never thought that at my age, I could feel, still feel such an emotion mm -hmm. in front of a painting, mm -hmm. due to Julian. Well, mm -hmm. I felt that just the other day. <laughs> I mean, actually, we were at the Musée d'Orsay, yeah. And, uh, with your show, I have a show there now where I was able to pick paintings from the collection and show uh, eleven paintings of mine with paintings from the collection. And that painting, self-portrait, is hanging next to a painting I made of Tina Chow in 1987. Mm -hmm. Anyway, somebody was taking a picture of me in front of it, so I had to stand there and look at it for a while, which was a great pleasure. But I'd seen it many times. But as I was looking at it, I realized why the movie is the way it is. And that is, when you look at the painting, you see all of the marks that he made. You see each mark. Each mark has its autonomy. Why is it making this noise? I don't know. Okay. And you because hear that? Here, let's, let's uh, liberate it a little bit. Okay. There you go. Another, no, no, no. Okay. Another technical point. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if you look, you can see each stroke. There's an orange stroke, there's some brown, there's a darker value. And what he was talking about actually was the mouth where basically his, his face is green and his lips are green, but there's an alarism crimson line that goes in the middle and there's a little bit of Prussian blue on the edge. And then there's a couple of white lines on the bottom of his lip, uh, which is reflected light. But anyway, Maybe one of the problems was when they were looking at his paintings then, mm -hmm. they kept seeing all the parts and the fragmentation was what was bothering them. Yes. And I think what we tried to do in the movie, and uh, uh, because there's a couple of different steps to this movie. I mean, mm -hmm. what Jean-Claude started to do and what I started to do with him is one thing, but mm -hmm. once we started to get out in nature, yeah. uh, and uh, deal with the physical reality of it. Mm -hmm. The script changed. And Louise, who was here with us, came into this and, and we started to reorganize the script. And it wasn't a script anymore. It was we organized what we needed to shoot and we started to invent other things. So yes. it kind of kept growing because Van Gogh is verbal and nonverbal. There are things, I mean, he did express the inexpressible, and I think that's kind of what the movie is about. Mm -hmm. But that fragmentation, if you look at the editing in the movie, yes, I think that um, you notice it. Now, it could get in the way, but at, at, after it stops getting in the way, mm -hmm. it starts to work on you. And you were saying to me, you ha you've seen the movie three times now, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And what has happened in the in the three times that the, you've seen the, it? The first time I was 
as usual, you know, uh, criticizing my work, you know, <laughs> and sometimes yours. It's a sort of critical. I, I can't prevent it, you know. And there's no reason to. <laughs> could have been better. Could have been. The second, I forgot about the the, the critics, and I just followed what was on the screen, you know. And the third time, which was yesterday, the day before yesterday, I was moved to tears, mm -hmm. finally, you know. And the emotion came uh, at the end. And uh, it means that I forgot my work, mm -hmm. I forgot Julian's work, mm -hmm. I forgot, and maybe I did even forget Van Gogh's work. Yes. Something was there which moved me. Yeah. And when we are moved, there is nothing you can say. Yes. There is nothing you can protest. You can say, I was wrong to be moved. But that would be absurd. You know? Or I was wrong that I wasn't moved. <laughs> right. yeah. But now we're all, we're all right. Right. Yeah, I wish I'd had a different reaction. <laughs> no, and, and when you say, Jean-Claude, that you were moved at the end of the film, do you mean by at a particular moment, for instance? No, from beginning to end. Yeah, uh, ah, yes. Of yeah. course. Mm. The, the, the way uh, uh, Willem acts, Van Gogh is fantastic. Mm. I mean, from time when he's left by, uh, by Gauguin, you mm. know, when he, when he cries, when he, uh, of these moments are made to me a motive, to me to give emotion. But from beginning to end, because I knew maybe how, it going, how is it going to end? Yes. You know, I, I know that all the efforts that Van Gogh makes mm. to be known to sell his painting are vain. Mm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and he's going to die mm. surrounded as, as uh, Julian shot it in the film beautifully. The, mm. the, the last uh, shot of the film is magnificent. Mm. And that it is, it's uh, historical. Mm. He died surrounded by piles of his paintings that nobody wanted to, to buy, but people were coming to a last visit to his body were allowed to take off freely one of the paintings or two. And that's the last scene of the film mm. is incredible. Mm. That, yes, break, uh, you know, tears. Mm. Well, I mean, and that was a funny, that was a, a funny story because the man who told me that is Belgian, and he was standing in front of the Ravo Inn in auvers sur oise and was hit by a car. Mm -hmm. And he survived, and he decided that that was his raison d'etre to own the Ravo Inn and take care of it as a museum. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted to shoot there, went to uh, uh, look at the location and had lunch with him, and then he started to show me around and at a certain moment, I mean, he gives a tour to people. But one thing he told me is because they thought Van Gogh committed suicide, he couldn't be buried in the church, so they took his coffin, they put it on a table in the middle of the Ravel Inn. And there was a window, there's a window uh, at one end of the room where these guys could look out the window and see if they liked a girl that came in. Um, and there was a kind of uh, voyeuristic, uh, window that was sort of high up, I thought was a perfect place to put a camera. Yes. Anyway, when I suggested to the man that maybe he didn't kill himself, he went ballistic, <laughs> and, 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 and it was a real problem. Uh, and in fact, uh, when we wanted to shoot there, <laughs> he said that we couldn't, unless we changed the ending. Yes. One, yeah. we couldn't have boys kill him, even if we didn't say we were sure about it. And the other thing is, since the book wasn't uh, authorized by, the, by the, the museum, he had a problem with that also. I see. Uh, the fact is, we looked at the drawings. They look pretty real to me. It's a great story. Who cares if they're real or not? And it, it, whether they killed him or he didn't, I mean, it just seemed to be a good thing for the movie. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, but he did tell me this story about how they put all his paintings around him and people were able to come in. <laughs> and, and that's why there were so many paintings in private hands also. Mm. Uh, so it was a great gift that he gave. And we built um, the Ravo Inn in Chambly, which mm -hmm. is not far away from auvers sur -Oise, And uh, 
and that's the scene. But mm-hmm. I mean, really, he gave that. And you know, we kind of had pieces of fragments of things that just uh, uh, seem to fall out of the sky by al really. Mm-hmm. Besides the fact that he would kind of talk about anything that would come, we'd have these conversations and Jean-Claude would be talking about the Gospels or about Vietnam mm-hmm. or about uh, Shakespeare. And I thought, mm-hmm. okay, well, that's dialogue. Yeah. And then we kind of... Uh, all, all these uh, scenes... Uh, come from uh, Van Gogh himself, because we know a lot about his life. He has written a lot of letters, you know, to his brother and to, to other people. The fact, when I read that he was constantly reading Shakespeare, mm. I was, you know, surprised. I, did, I never read uh, this in a, a, any book about. So that uh, little scene between him and Madame Ginou in the in the film about about uh, Richard III, you yes. know, and also. The long scene with the priest yes. is a real possibility. The priest came to see him. We don't know, of course, what they say to each other. But to me, it was extremely interesting to try to write scenes that could have happened. Yes. You know, yeah. could, likely. You know, and and uh, except uh, uh, this one was uh, one, of, one of them. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, he talks about the Christ, about Jesus, that he knows about the Gospels and about some other text, this is absolutely re- yes, true. Sure, he was the son of a pastor, and he mm-hmm. was a Protestant pastor. And the, the, I like very much in that scene the the acting and the attitude of the priest, with with so uh, yes, Mickelson is just yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, it relates very much to what of nuances, you know, <coughs> that, uh, that, and finally, he frees him. Yes. It relates to what Julian was saying about how people must have seen Van Gogh's paintings at the time. They're just yeah. seeing the, the different choices. That's what Mads Mikkelsen yeah. is saying, but can't you see that, you know, the work that you've done is... In other words, that seed never happened. Yes. We don't know. Any, maybe it did, but mm-hmm. we know anything about, about it. Yes. So. But, but the funny thing is, for example, uh, yeah, the, there's something about Shakespeare, but the fact that Madame Junot says... You shouldn't read bastard plays? No, that she says, uh, do you know him? Yeah. No, he lived a long time ago. <laughs> yes. Or uh, uh, when he says, I find him to be the most mysterious writer, and she says, well, when I read something, I like to understand what I'm reading. I mean, <laughs> that yeah, yeah. is different than, than just being about Shakespeare, and that's the and, charm and of what he... And one do. of my favorite lines... When she says, "I like a story to be," said. yeah, I think we're everybody's. Can everybody like else it. is everybody else okay with the levels? Okay, okay, great. When she says, uh, "Madame Ginou, I like a story to be sad." Yes. Uh. Mm-hmm. Um, and Emmanuel Sonnier's delivery of all that yeah. stuff is, is great. Impeccable. That first take also. She's very good. Mm. I mean, all the actors are great in this movie. I mean, well, can I actually ask you about one actor and one mom, Neil Zara strip with that incredible tattoo that he has on his face, the, the Tonkin tattoo? What would you like that, to know about that? I'd like to know about the tattoo. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, I, and, and perhaps there's something in Van Gogh's letters about it's it. It's a real story. Okay. It's yeah. a real story that he's mm-hmm. telling. Mm-hmm. Which uh, happened during the war in Tonkin, yes. which, which, which was our Vietnam, yes. you know, sure. sometime before, and uh, a, a little girl was born in a cave, mm. in, in a, you know, far from any light, and lived for twelve years yeah. before discovering the light of the sun. Mm-hmm. That's what he said, and then, then Van Gogh says that he he paints some light. Mm. You know. But what he's asking. Mm is where the tattoo comes yeah. from. And that is Niels Aristrup, who is a brilliant actor, He's who incredible. said, I want to have a tattoo on my face. Yeah. And so we looked up 19th century tattoos mm-hmm. and made the tattoo. Uh, I wanted, when he says that about the key, I wanted him to have a key on his neck. Yeah. Yeah. Besides, he has this little keychain over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, but... 
basically Jean-Claude was telling me the story about Vietnam uh, and obviously it says Tonkin instead of Vietnam because we didn't want to take you totally out of the movie yes but to have Van Gogh talk about <coughs> Vietnam to talk about Shakespeare to talk about that nobody knew who Christ was to a priest was a great opportunity mm -hmm. to sort of address things that are beyond just painting just about being thinking and what are the variables that compose whatever our reality is. Yes. And, uh, and if you want to know everything, the story of the key yes. happened to me during the war in Algeria. Ah. I was the secretary of a co colonel, and he, there was a coffer, and I had the key inside where all the files about what the officers and, and of the regiment had done. Yes. Well, it was awful. Mm -hmm. I knew everything because I had the key. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to write the, the, the appreciation for being, uh, you know, uh, up-rated. Yes. And Promoted. not only I had the key, but they all knew I had the key. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, he is a madman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if this is a master class about writing, what that would say is use your personal experience. Yeah. You can be wrong or right, but you won't be full of shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you can't avoid it to and, use your personal experience. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's one element. But yeah. I have to, and I want to say that, yes, we wrote this and we interacted because his approach, I mean, for example, just exactly like you saw, it happened to him. Yes. And there are moments and there are things that basically <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> so when he says of this thing where... Uh, when when uh, Dr. Gachet says to him, uh, why do you paint? And he says, to stop thinking. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And he's, well, uh, about what? Well, just to stop thinking. A form of meditation? No, I, when I paint, I stop thinking. Yes. And I become a part of everything that's outside of me and inside of me. Well, an Aborigine painter told me that once, and mm -hmm. I thought that was a pretty damn good explanation of what happens when you're making art. Yes. Uh, or when they're in the, uh, uh, when Gauguin is talking to him about surface. Yes. If you look at Gauguin's paintings, you'll see that they're very flat. And he took a lot of time, a lot more time, with the surface of his painting. Yeah. So it's illogical. Did I ever hear Van Gogh and Gauguin talking about that or a conversation? No. Do I think they could have talked about that? Yes. Uh, and... Uh, but when he says to him, uh, the, you know, the faster I paint, the better I feel, mm -hmm. or they call it the act of painting for a reason, yes. that's natural for me to say about that. So sometimes I'm speaking uh, through his voice. Mm -hmm. And then there's other moments where Louise, who uh, I guess Louise met Jean-Claude through me, and then she kind of... Uh, restructured everything at a certain moment mm -hmm. and we kind of went out into nature yes. and uh, also editing is writing yeah and there are things that uh, might be great as ideas but they don't necessarily work once you're out in the field right and i think that there's a lot of things that are adapted to the physical dimension which is nonverbal in this movie there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, space in this movie where there's no talking and there are different equivalences and I think one thing that we tried to do with the black and you can talk about how you feel about that in a moment but that kind of segues into other things that have to do we kind of don't have the same um, uh, relationship to music in, 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 in the film I mean, he... He has a different opinion well, about Louis the music. Well, Louis didn't like to have music in movies. He doesn't like to have music but, in movies. But, uh, but yeah. Louis was deaf. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was the reason. There's a reason, so there's for a reason why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so, <coughs> so in, you know, once we got out there, yeah. um, and also, for example, the way that um, the this, this scene with Gabby works, because there were much more elaborate kind of things, but sometimes... Uh, you don't have to say so much. Yes. So it's, I'm just saying that if we're talking about writing, you know, we're it's a process, and you have to be able to let go of things that you might think are great. Yes. Uh, kill, I just give you an wings. example 
of one thing which had to do with Before Night Falls, where Rinaldo Arenas opens his refrigerator and um, he's talking about, um, I I he said, the difference between the capitalist system and the communist system is that in the communist system, when they give you a kip a kick in the ass, you have to applaud. <laughs> in the capitalist system, you can scream. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I came here to scream. Now, if he would have said, I came here to scream on screen, that's kind of over. Yeah. But if he just said, stopped at uh, Applaud. Applaud. And then he said, and he, then he looks and he says, uh, I, I can't eat papaya, which is a, which is a, 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 a euphemism for pussy yeah. in Cuban, uh, but except in a jar. Yeah. And then so he that says, but I'm, when I'm writing a novel, I can eat very quickly. I like to eat baby food. Mm -hmm. And we talk about baby food. But I'm just saying the important thing that you might want to say might get be more important if it doesn't have a punchline and yeah. you've got something that segues into something that's real. It's transmitted through other yeah. means. And I think that yeah. what we did when we were shooting was to find things that, because I believe also that Van Gogh's physical, there's no way to also see that in a room. Yeah. You need to go out there. Once you're out there uh, and we walked, and you have to walk, you're never gonna walk as much as he did, but you've gotta do a lot of walking to kind of understand how arduous it was to get that far to the far edge of society in order to make that work. Yes. And so we have these parts where there's no talking and there's a physical, there's sound or there's a landscape and then there are these big heads that talk to you which are like the portraits. Mm -hmm. So I think that was kind of a, another. But you also mentioned the black. Yeah, talk about the black, if you feel like it. Uh, the, the, well, first of all, I'd like to say that one of the scenes in the film that I like most is the scene of the shoes when he's painting the shoes. Yes, yes. Because there is no one word and no action at all. Yeah. I mean, uh, you have to. Well, that's a scene that he wrote. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that Which I wrote is really and, great. And that Van, Van Gogh <coughs> lived. Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and I, and I uh, turned into a painting. No, no, the, the fact that. Uh, <laughs> You feel she everything. Edited. You feel that he's poor, that he has, that he's exhausted, yes. that he has nothing to eat yes. except a little piece of cheese, you know, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know what to do. He's not so happy with his work of the day. Now, and then all of a sudden, he sees his shoes, very dirty, full of, covered with mud and, and uh, herbs, and then he starts painting and painting gives him a new energy. Yes. You know, that's a, a new reason to stay alive yes. that night, you know. Mm -hmm. that it's, it's a short scene that you could, you know, any, maybe any screenwriter would say, well, what's the use of that scene? Mm -hmm. You can take it off and throw it, and throw it away. No, 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 it's something intimate, difficult to write, and, and, um, and that Julian, uh, Shot very very well, and and not talking about Willem. Difficult to write in what sense? Because nothing happens. Yes, right. It's so a the non, simplicity of the it's genius. a non-action yeah. scene. You know? Yes, but nothing happens. But the difference mm -hmm. is that you see somebody turn this crummy room into this magnificent painting, mm -hmm. uh. and so he could spin straw into gold if gold was something worth something. I mean, he can, what yeah. I'm saying is, he turned that room into that painting. Yes. And he turned something that was relatively drab and sort of dreary into something delicious and, and full of life. Yes, and and so it's also important the, what the scene comes out of because it comes out of his conversation with Gauguin where he says, I'm tired of this gray light in Paris, and Gauguin says, go south where the light is golden, and then there's a cut to this gray sky and the wind blowing and the, yeah. But what was your question? I remember. It was about I the black. It was about the, uh, about the, the how black, the black yeah. function for you. But all, I just wanted to say that the fact that he paints those shoes, yeah. you get the bang out of your dollars. Yes. If he didn't, I mean, something. so there is an action that occurs. In fact, people get to watch somebody painting. And last night when I was watching it, I thought it was very dramatic to see him, if he could accomplish that. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. at one moment, I, I wrote a script for The Perfume, which has never been made. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that someday if I ever make another movie. But 
my goal was for everybody to get rid of their morals completely mm -hmm. and just wonder, does the perfume work? Mm -hmm. And you could kind of see that the perfume worked when he painted the painting. And I yes. thought that that is why the scene works. But uh, it, it was great. You know, I think we were also thinking about, I was at least, and uh, Louise, about Robert Bresson, you know, yes. just nothing going on for a while. And, yeah, and there is a story I told you already, which uh, I, I recall, you know, every time. Uh, the story of an old Christian hermit on the fourth century, mm -hmm. running around in the deserts of Syria and screaming, I have an answer. I have an answer. Who has a question? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so you have a question about the black. Yes, please. I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the question is, do you feel the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. black? Yeah, the no, no, it was the, uh, at the very beginning, I'd like very much to start with a black and a voice saying, I just would like to be one of them, you know, and to, to me that was a, an excellent beginning. And then later, for instance, about the story of cutting his ear, we did, it's impossible to shoot. Nobody exactly knows what happened, what, why it was. So to put a black at that moment with yeah. his voice telling this to us, you know, seemed a, a rather good solution and not only a good solution, but a cinematographical solution, you know, because we, we must never forget that the black screen belongs to the movie's language, you know, like a voice over and only to the, to the movie language, you know. And another thing about that is that when there was a possible, some uh, obviously um, people, when they work with you on a movie, they try to help, but usually they don't. So I would suggest to people that listen to everybody and then don't take their advice. Mm. No, because they're gonna get you to cut out of your film what most characterize it is that yours. And so we, uh, yeah. so after we stopped shooting and we came back, uh, Louise, who had no intention of editing this film, we just never stopped working, so she put the AVID program on her computer, and we edited this movie in an airplane in Costa Rica, in Mexico, wherever we went. And by the time we were supposed to meet the editor... Yeah. And it shows. Yeah, it does. It, shows. <laughs> it does show. We were so far gone that we couldn't... We didn't want to uh, conform. And obviously there... Uh, some really, really good suggestions were, why don't you put a voiceover and you can see him walking while he's, you hear him. That doesn't make you feel closer to the guy. You're watching that. So uh, if he's uh, talking to himself, is what he's doing when he's in the black, until he, you realize he's talking to Dr. Ray, where we could kind of have some flexibility sometimes or whatever, but the black, uh, and also, it was very important for me not to talk about art when he was at the beginning, where he said, I'd just like somebody to give me a piece of fruit, some ham, ask me, how are you today? Keep it simple, uh, because if you say, you know, I don't want to, we at a certain moment, there was a, where we uh, definitely don't want to talk about art. You don't want to talk about art when you're making a movie about art until the artists are talking about art. So I think he just wanted to... Um, feel good, be, uh, had normal desire like anybody else. And, and ultimately, I don't know that it's just, I don't think the movie's really just about painting. I think it's about being. And uh, after the process of doing this, through painting, Willem was saying yesterday that he felt like he saw everything differently. Mm -hmm. he, um, he He's going to have an exhibit. Soon, with him as a painter. Yeah. Oh, that he's kidding. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs>
The paintings in the movie are painted by... Uh, uh, Willem painted some of the paintings. Yeah. I mean, when you see Willem painting the shoes, he's painting the shoes. Mm -hmm. I painted part of that, and I taught him how to paint. But uh, what's so funny? <laughs> <laughs> I amuse you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I think it was very important for Willem to paint and not to be faking it. And I think he was more concerned that when he was painting, if it would look like it wasn't real. So he was painting and he, I think, started to look at things very differently. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were sitting in, a, uh, I guess we did a Q&A yesterday, and the mm -hmm. lights were right on, t well, uh, there's still lighting in here now, but it was more evident that there was a light on top of everyone, and you could just see where everybody's forehead was, and their arms were sticking out, and I said, you know, now he can look at the audience, and he could just see where the light and the dark parts are, because he started to say, when I started, I tried to paint a whole tree, and then... I realize I'm just supposed to paint where the light is hitting. And so I just, just don't be in a rush. You can't build a brick wall in day either. You need one brick at a time. And when you make paintings, it's one mark at a time. Anyway. Mm. Do you, we were going to talk about the music and your different relationships to the music. So Jean-Claude, do you feel differently about the music than Julian does? Well, now he really likes it. OK. <laughs> yeah, about the music, yes, it's yes. not. It's only one piano, you know, from yes. uh, and, and violin at, uh, yes, at one at the moment. End, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, from the very beginning, the music was part of the film. Yes. So uh, at, the danger would be to put too much music and too insisting mm -hmm. when, when the music is illustrating the action. Yes. It means the action is weak. You know, you know so some, very often I heard uh, some writers and directors say, yes, that scene is not very good, but we need put to put some, some music, music there. Yeah. We put yeah. some good music. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's ab absurd, you know. That was not the case. Mm -hmm. no, of, of course not. Uh, I think in the film, what surprises me most is all the part with the music, with Van Gogh marching, you know, the trees, all this that I have ne never seen before in any other film. Yes. You know, that sort of. Uh, mixing between different sensations yes. you know that I, I've never seen before well the, the music feels like it harmonizes with yeah, them. Yeah, it yeah. feels like it's what were you saying as about as the as music as that day? Th what were you saying well the, the, the way that the music it. is recorded gives it a very um, it doesn't feel you know denatured it feels like it's like <coughs> you can feel the human breath in it and so I think that that, uh, that really harmonizes beautifully <coughs> with but what you're seeing to me, for instance, yesterday night, it was like th if the music was sounding inside his yeah. head. Yes. You know what I mean? Because there's a little echo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. I thought that all the time. Mm. Yeah. But he needed to see it three times to feel that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I'd say that it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I agree. Uh, uh, he resisted. Mm hmm. And he's connected to it. And yes. so that's pretty good when that can happen, where you finally feel... I mean, I've made paintings that I... I have a show in Denmark now, and there's four paintings hanging in a room. Three of them, they were painted in 1990. Three of them I could look at when I made them, and one of them I put away for 22 years. Yes. And pulled it out after 22 years. Now, if you make a movie and you say, okay, to the producers, I'm going to pull it out in 22 years and we'll see how it is, yeah. they might not like that. Yeah, but with the painting you can do that. But it's really interesting. You can't hear something, and when you could finally see it, it's amazing that you're not always ready to. But it's a process, you know. I think that there's a lot of uh, teeth pulling that goes on. I was extremely disturbed while uh, I was making the movie. I loved doing it, but felt like this is wrong. That's wrong. This could be wrong. This could be. Th this can go wrong. This mm -hmm. is. This so every day is a problem. And I think you feel like that with the, whatever you want to say. You have to be responsible for every word, every frame, every spontaneous gesture. Yes. Because you can erase it later. An artist is responsible for whatever they put in the world. Yes. That's a difference between... No, the only question is, 
is a movie director an artist? Well, uh, it is an artist. First of all, I'm not using an artist as, a, a as, a, as, a, as an adjective. I mean, they're good artists and bad artists. I mean, there's good art and bad art. And just because you're an artist, that doesn't make you good. So I want to be clear about that. But if you want to be an artist, the difference between just a photographer and an artist is a photographer can just take a picture and they're not responsible. But if the photographer is an artist, mm -hmm. they're responsible for what they put in the world. I had that conversation with Helmut Newton a million years ago. Yeah. Who was an artist? Yes. And a photographer. Yeah. But then you can decide if he's a good artist or a bad artist. That's not the point. But I just think that when somebody says it's a work of art, it doesn't mean that... That it's good. That it's good. Yeah. yeah. It's just a fact. Like, that's a hamburger. But <laughs> what, what you taught me is that any artist needs a technique. Absolutely. Without the technique, a gift mm -hmm. is nothing but a mania. Yes. You know. That's uh, some... Ingmar That's Bergman. good. A gift is nothing but a mania. That's good. I think Ingmar Without Bergman right. said also, I don't believe in inspiration. I believe in application. Mm -hmm. And, you know, application and the development sure. of the technique along the way. When, when, you, when you get a gift, yes. which is something very rare in, uh, among humanity, yes. you must deserve it. Mm. And the only way to deserve it is to work. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, that's, that is worth a round of applause. <laughs> The, and there's one movie that I did think of, uh, not when we were doing it, but when we were kind of watching what we were doing, which was Persona. When B.B. Anderson describes her sexual encounter with this guy yeah. on the beach, I mean, you're not oh, seeing you're it, just on you her just face. have her talking yeah. about it. And why not have somebody talking about it? Because um, obviously when somebody talks to you, you have images that go off in your head that are your personal images that yeah. are different than the one that somebody is seeing in their head. Yes. And so in the black, um, I love the f when he starts to say, um, uh, I don't know why I, I, uh, I uh, yeah, I might have hurt Gauguin uh, uh, about Gauguin. We had some fights. And then he said, and then I gave my ear to the girl at the bar, to Gabby, I thought that, uh, and he said, there was blood all over the place. I think she thought I was going to kill her. Mm -hmm. And and then you just see him uh, talking to Dr. Ray. Mm -hmm. and But to hear him tell the story of that after the scene that was in the Ali Skamp mm -hmm. where Gauguin leaves him, uh, and then you see Willem with that bandage around his head, mm -hmm. for me, was... If you get that far into the movie, once he's doing that, you're gone. Yes. May I tell the story I told you about uh, Persona? I think you should definitely tell that story. <laughs> we um, went to see Persona in, in, in the Paris theater with Binwell, the two of us. And we loved the film, and Binwell was extremely excited, exactly about what Julian said. The fact that the same images and the same voice, the same story is said twice. You know, with different images, you know, mm. and uh, uh, twice exactly the same word, from it, but for ten minutes, you know. So sometimes, so later, I met uh, Bergman invited me to to assist one of his shooting in in the, the island, and I told Bergman what Bunuel had told me about, you know. Mm. So he was very happy, and uh, and he said, but you know, at the beginning, I did not intend to shoot like this. I tried the classical way to go from one, the one who, who speaks to the one who listens out here. And it didn't work for some reason. And I realized, and that's a beautiful phrase, that a story that you tell is not the same story that you are listening at. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Not the same. In other words, the images change the story itself, the words, the power of images upon words. Mm. That's a very famous example. Persona is one of my old, old-time favorites, as, we, as you said. I guess in a certain way, other similarities with that movie were that 
normally somebody probably would cut away from the priest. Yes. Or yeah. from the guy and uh, uh, kneels the man in the tub, or yeah. or from Emmanuel. But yeah. we felt like um, everything was an interruption. Yeah. Was and and it was important to because also they're talking to the camera. Willem is not talking to the camera, except when he's talking after he's cut his ear off. Yes. So. Uh, it really feels like uh, the story is told in the first person. Yes. So it's not about him. You are him. And I thought that that... W and, and the other thing about, say, persona is when you're hearing the story, you're hearing it in the first person. She's telling the story uh, mm. to... Um, what's her name? Uh, Lee Bullman. Pete yeah, Anderson to is telling the story to, to, Lee to live. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, another element of being him is the split diopter effect, you know, where the, the bottom of the screen becomes, um, does all kinds of actually wonderful things. And actually, um, I was talking to your DP, Benoit Dalam, uh, last night, and he was telling me that he, the, the lenses that he used for this film were very old and gave all kinds of incredible flaws, which he wanted. He wanted to have those kinds of problems to deal with problems, quote unquote, um, to just keep the screen alive with light. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about the split diopter a little bit. And yes. How that worked in the process. I went to a vintage store and bought some sunglasses. Right. I didn't realize that they were bifocals when I bought them. <laughs> <laughs> so I put them on, I walked outside, and I looked in the grass, and there was a step in the grass. And I thought, wow, that's good. I like that. So I gave Benoit the glasses, and I said, would you put this on the lens? Well, they were a little small for the lens, so we needed to build a split diopter to do that. But uh, it was very important. Uh, it was very important to have uh, his point of view be different than, and also because it's not really gauged in a way. I mean, there are different versions of this because there's a horizontal line that comes through that. But on occasion, if it didn't want it to be too mechanical. We didn't attach it to the camera, so Benoit could move his hand like that. For so example, the scene with, uh, with with Oscar when he's leaving. Yes. So Benoit is uh, moving his hand while he's while he's holding the lens in front of the camera. Yeah. Also, Benoit ran out of the chapel while Willem is running out, and um, there's a lot of running going on in the movie. But I mean, Benoit devised a way to hold the camera in front of him where he could go up, down, and he could kind of, and sometimes I would say, even like this. Yeah. Even while he was taught well. Yeah. And he shot with the red, the red yeah. weapon. And, and I, you know, I was reluctant to use a digital camera. Yeah. Uh, really works great. And you could, I mean, basically, sometimes, uh, I guess we, we, I mean, really, it was sort of like Louise, Willem, Benoit, and I were one person. Yes. Really, one person. And uh, uh, luckily, so we had, what, uh, eight set of eyes? Yeah. Four sets of eyes, eight eyes. Eight eyes, but, yeah. But that's <laughs> better than having two. Yeah. And... Uh, there were moments where once Benoit, because when we first sent Benoit to, because there was no uh, wheat in France in September. So we sent him to Scotland to shoot his feet. So Benoit is, and, and they were very, I was worried because uh, they said this guy has more equipment to go to Scotland for three days than we had in the whole last movie we made. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Anyway, he <laughs> got used. So he went there, and he's wearing Van Gogh's shoes, his pants, and his hat. In case there's a camera shadow, you can get Van Gogh's shadow on the floor, mm -hmm. too. And we ended up using very, very little of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Louise and I looked through six hours of film and took about a minute out of it, but it mm -hmm. was worth it. But Benoit became Van Gogh also and when he came back and so at times van gogh 
or Benoit mm -hmm. and Willem Van Gogh ran into the abyss and I have to call them back because we're using that camera that really works and okay could the DP and the actor come back please because they'd be and they we just never stopped shooting yeah and we were also shooting um, seven hour days because we lost part of the financing and they said we well, can do this in seven hours. instead of eight hours of course I mean I, I've shot 18 hour days in Mexico seven hour days we can sure and yeah. everybody gets off for lunch in France and then we had magic hour every day around 5.30, quarter to 6 in all. So uh, Louise would be looking and we'd go to all of these different locations mm -hmm. and find stuff to shoot. Mm -hmm. and, and that was amazing. I mean, and really the wind and the, the – because it's not a cozy, inviting place when you first go down there. When he said go south, I think he thought he was going to really – A paradise uh, of And you expect light. to see yellow sunflowers, but those flowers looked like a concentration camp, yeah. and they were cool. Yeah. And it, we, it was a great thing to be able to shoot. And, and, and obviously, we even had to put Arl south of France – just because most people thought he was still in he was, Paris. He was back in the Netherlands. And they yeah. lost the yeah. joke, so fuck it. We did a little <laughs> compromise. Just just point him in the direction just a teeny weeny bit. And Willem referred to Benoit as his dance partner, right? Uh, and and Willem shot some of this movie. I mean, mm -hmm. and first, I don't know if Benoit wanted to give up the camera exactly sometimes, but but Willem actually shot the part when he's walking home and these people are watching him walking from Champonville uh, to to uh, auvers sur -Oise. Yes. I mean, he's shooting that mm -hmm. and did somewhere. He's running with the camera. Yeah. But I, it's amazing to me that, I mean, Benoit is not only a lighting guy, he and he's fast, but he is probably the best handheld operator in the world. Yeah, and he, he said he really liked that. He didn't do any over the, uh, over the shoulder. He didn't put a rig on his shoulder. He tried. Yeah. Yeah, he, I mean he had. It's a what is it called? Um, what's it? F the weapon brain? No, no. What's it called? Uh, when you try to fix something, it's a, 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 a it's jerry like rig. Or no, no. It's like supply and demand. What's the other thing? I don't know. Come on, it's uh, yin and yang, uh, black and white, uh, supply and demand. What's it? It's trial and error. There you go. <laughs> Throw it on the wall. <laughs> see what sticks. Black and white, yin and yang, peanut butter and chocolate. Um, in fact, in fact, Benoit, uh, for example, uh, wanted to try some infrared film. I love the m the movie I Am Cuba, yep. and uh, anyway, he had some infrared film. So he shot when 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 Vincent is painting, and what's interesting about that particular moment is because when it's in black and white and you don't see the color, you see it spatially. In fact, if you look at if you ever see the movie again. Uh, there's the left side of the canvas. You're just seeing the trees, and you think that that's the painting. Mm. And then all of a sudden, it com it's in color again, and it bounces back. But you think, oh, um, are we going to take the people out of the movie again? Yes. But uh, also, for example, anyway, so that was really Benoit bringing that film and saying, well, why don't we try this, we, which was something that we thought we'd try at the Ali Scamp. But, you know, you get there, and uh, I can't stress enough for me, as a filmmaker, how important it is. I couldn't have done this in a studio. Yeah. And we had no idea that that, I knew that the Ali Scamp was there. I'd seen the paintings that Van Gogh and Gauguin made, but I never was inside of that building. Mm -hmm. And we went in the building and it looked like something out of Andre Rublev. So we reconstructed that scene in order to where, instead of Van Gogh, of uh, uh, Instead of Gauguin running away from him and him crying or hanging, beating his hands on this on this sarcophagus, mm -hmm. which would have been very difficult, once you get in that building, you realize that if he runs out, then Gauguin has to try to appease him or bring him back somehow. Yes. And I don't know if there's anybody's ever broken up with somebody here that went crazy. You, you try to you feel ashamed or whatever yes. it is and then you try to kind of fix it but when somebody's totally gone then you just okay I'm in above my head here yes and that scene for me was extremely so that stuff is I'm just saying that you have to be flexible yeah because you can see a movie like for example Inherent Vice okay 
which you showed at the New York Film Festival. Yes, we did. Centerpiece. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson is a great friend of mine, and I love his work. But that particular movie, I think he really tried to stick to the sensibility of the author. And at mm -hmm. a certain moment, you got that, but I was lost. You felt like he didn't give himself... And, and, and it be, of course, he didn't have the... Didn't and the he, lo he, he, he wanted to be so respectful somehow mm -hmm. that he... Uh, it kind of got him. It got immersed in that. And I, I mean, I, it, I just it lost me. Maybe I mm -hmm. need to see it a few mm -hmm. more times. But, mm -hmm. but um, so I think that uh, you need to uh, like life. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might think that something is really great, but you have to kind of make it for yourself. Yes. And yep. you need to be able to respond without. I hear Brando saying about killing those uh, kids in uh, Vietnam. You know, w without judgment. You mm -hmm. know, without judgment you just have to just trust your impulse to do something well it reminds me last week alfonso cuaron was talking about making uh roma which he shot himself and he said you know i wrote the script and he said but i didn't show it to anybody because i didn't want to hear anybody's good ideas because i knew that if i did it would i would follow them which echoes something that you said earlier and it also raises and there's a, you, you talked about the the four pairs of eyes um and Jean-Claude, you were not there on the set during shooting, and you said when the writer is present on the shooting, it means you, there's you a problem. Usually the screenwriter is not going to the set. Right. When he goes to the set... There's a problem, you said. It, it's a bad sign. Yeah. yeah. It means that <laughs> something goes wrong. You know, the director or the producer calls him, and an actor refuses yeah. to say that, or these, I mean, uh, you know, so... Yeah. And also, when the, the screenwriter arrives, everybody stops, uh, kisses him, you know, <laughs> and uh, and the director yeah, uh, and well. the director goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> Were you present during the shoots with Benoit? No. With uh, with uh, Luis Benoit, were you present at when uh, those films were being when, shot? Uh, when uh, Luis Benoit wanted me to be on the set, yes, he gave me a part. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> Always the part. Of an ecclesiastic, yes, you know, mm -hmm. I was I, I, I was a curé in the diary of a chambermaid. Mm -hmm. I was a bishop in the, uh, the Milky Way. The Milky Way, yes. And uh, excuse me, I've said that, but it's so strange. Uh, the bishop is called uh, Prisciliano in Spanish. Mm -hmm. He's a very known historical character in Spain. Yes. A very famous her heretic. And uh, three years ago. I received a letter uh, in Spanish from Spain from the association of Los Amigos de Prisciliano. <laughs> and they asked me to be the president ah. of this association. Uh. So, are you the uh, president now? Yeah, I Congratulations. Am. So you are, you, have, yeah. uh, you are facing the president of uh, uh, <laughs> Los Amigos de Prisciliano, <laughs> <laughs> who was burned. Ah. Yeah, was born, uh, ah. Uh, that makes the honor even yeah. more <laughs> resounding. It was the bishop greater. of Avila. We're actually about out of time. So do we have any closing thoughts? Just, just to make a... Uh, uh, we're just to make a laugh, a last two, this small really one. Ask, okay, there's there's a guy who really wants okay, to ask a question. He's people. dying to there's ask one, a question. Two, three, four. There's okay, four well, people. I think we might not have okay. time for all of them, but Everyone let's start with this guy who... Somebody's going to pass a microphone down. Uh, no, you gotta you gotta use the microphone. You're not allowed to just use the loud voice. Uh, okay. Great. What about the use of language? Can you tell me a few words about that? Do you guys tell use language? We never say no. the word fuck in the movie. <laughs> um, no, no, okay. I'm referring. No, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, I do know what you mean. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, the French, use of French language. And English. Um, so the movie is in English, but. When they're French people, they speak French. Uh, did Van Gogh speak? Well, first of all, he was Dutch. So he didn't speak French as like a French person, but he certainly spoke French better than Willem Dafoe. But he read Shakespeare in, in English. English. But I was he read just ask. Ex exactly. He read Shakespeare in English. So uh, for me, uh, I thought it. When, when, and normally when people are from a 
foreign country, they speak the language with their family at home. So, for example, when he's talking to his brother, they're speaking English. But the guys in the Le Tambourin are speaking French. So, and then when Gauguin walks out of there, out of the Tambourin, and he knows Theo, and he knows that uh, Vincent speaks English, he speaks English to him. Did he really know that he spoke English? No. Do I have him speak English because the movie's in English? Yes. Is it a nice transition where he speaks French perfectly and then he speaks English to him? Yes. Is it <coughs> realistic? No. It's much better than realistic. I mean, it's film. And I think when you make a film, you've got to make your own conventions. So don't worry about that if you're going to make a film, because I don't. Do you have a comment about that? Uh, I have too many comments. Okay. <laughs> All right, next. We're just going to do one more question, and then we can do the other ones on I the do way agree. out. I do agree. Okay, he agreed. Great. Well, first of all, it's a great honor being with you two guys, you know, really. One of the highlights of my life. <laughs> and um, uh, I wanted to ask you... Forget, forget about <laughs> the word, honor. <laughs> Please put pleasure. Okay, pleasure, for sure. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, ask you um, two th things that are like part of the main question, right? So in the film Basquiat, um, you were there, you lived that time, and it was very intimate. But there was this image of the surfing, you know, him surfing, I think right. it was you, right? That really like put you in, in, in a different place every time you would see the story from a different angle. Right. So my, my, my question is, what, how did you create your intimacy with an, a different time? You were not there. And what was that surfing image? in your mind, you know, that, you know what I mean, that image that connected you with his mind and his world as an artist. What's the equivalent of the yeah, surfing image? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, with Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Well, what would you say? It feels to me like the whole movie, like the way that you made the movie so gesturally is the equivalent of what you're referring to as the surfing image. I, I, that's what it feels like to me. That's a good answer. Okay. <laughs> What's your question? So I'm writing a movie about the correlation between creative genius or geniuses and mental health right. or mania. So I was waiting. Obviously, Van Gogh is on my list of, some, well, very legendary okay. people. Question is, um, how, were you thinking about this? And who wrote that part when he's talking to uh, Mathieu Amalric, I think, the doctor, Dr. about that he needs he needs to uh, be kind of out of control or crazy when making his art. Oh, I think uh, well he's actually he's he's or actually he's saying that to, to uh, I forgot. well he's he's actually says yeah to Dr. Gaget that uh, and this is a quote from Van Gogh actually when he said okay. uh, a, a grain of madness is the best in art. That's straight out of Van Gogh's letters. But uh, that doesn't tell you much about mental illness. And uh, we're not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but uh, certain facts exist. Uh, one is that we know that he actually went out of the asylum and disappeared for four days and lost his shit. We know that he took some stuff with him when he came back, he didn't have anything else. And we know that uh, he would have these moments where he would black out and he didn't know what happened. Now, some people say that's epilepsy or whatever. I'm not going there at all. But what I would say is that there is um, one thing that's in the film, and there, the, the, he gets taken to the asylum in a carriage, and then he gets taken to the asylum in a carriage. And that re repetitive uh, physical uh, return kind of... Um, uh, em exacerbates and, and, and amplifies this sort of uh, physical uh, uh, magnet of anxiety, going mad, the fear of going mad. And uh, so I think that things happen uh, that are nonverbal that give you a, a feeling. When he goes to see his brother and his sister-in-law, uh, there's these dissolves that occur there. Uh, and in the editing, I, th I think you feel like... And in the mix. Yeah, right? that, the sound also, he, mm -hmm. he's not... So, I, I don't know if anybody's ever taken LSD and had a bad trip that's in this audience, but I certainly have. 
and uh, or just been very depressed and thought you were going mad and you get very, very scared. Uh, and I think that um, the fear of that, and I think he addressed it in, in dialogue, which I never would have written. Uh, and uh, I was kind of, uh, I thought that was amazing that he would be so specific about saying, well, did you see ghosts? I see this. And I mean, he, he talked about angels. I mean, he was a very religious guy. Um, Van Gogh, but, the, the, but to me, I feel that you think he's fine when he gets out of the asylum and he goes to see his brother and he ha get, has a meltdown. And I don't know how everybody relates to their family here, but people can <laughs> press some buttons that are very familiar to you. And so um, uh, I think that you show, in this case, we're showing something without illustrating something, but it absolutely has to do with, because uh, I don't think that he was mad. Uh, and but I do think that uh, you could be very very good at something and not very good at something else. Mm -hmm. I think he was very good at painting and very good at feeling at one with nature. I think he had a very difficult time with people, and so that was a car crash to him. And any time that he had interaction with them, it was. Usually, but so what's interesting about the movie is that he gets to be different with everybody because everybody's different. And that, I feel, is very realistic because you're not the same with me or the person at home or your mother. Or and so I feel like um, there's some things that can't be explained. I mean, if you ask me what the opposite of truth is, I would say reason. Once people start explaining to you why something's that way, they're already lying to you. Hmm. So go figure. Um, we do have to wrap effort. it up. I'm sorry, but yeah, oh, we have some people. Thing from Jean Claude. Hmm. You have Can some you some people who do behave sorry. as if they were genius. Yeah. You know, they scream around. They do crazy things, and what they do is nothing. And some genius like Shakespeare are very secret, discreet. We we don't know anything about him. You know, he was probably speaking gently to everybody. But keeping his genius as a secret. You know, the two ways are possible. You know, but the, the behavior doesn't mean anything. Well, that'll give you something. That'll do it. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.